sparkling clear blue waters, sun-kissed shores, a magnificent sight to behold. Beaches are one of the Caribbean's most envied commodities. Boasting of never-ending stretches of unspoilt picturesque waters, beaches provide that much-needed escape from the bustle of daily life. Beneath our general perception of beaches, however, lies a far greater value to this natural wonder. A beach is essentially an accumulation of materials such as boulders, pebbles, shingle, sand and mud on a sloping or shelving ground which extend from mean low tide to the uppermost extent of wave impact. The tiny particles that make up beaches can sometimes have biological origins such as shell fragments or coralline algae fragments. Beaches are often formed along coastal areas where wave or current action deposits and reworks sediments. Sand will take on a different character depending on what particular island you happen to be looking at. So for example, on the islands which have volcanoes and that sort of um, lava and material, you will find that the sand there happens to be of a particular nature. It often tends to be black because of its volcanic source. In Barbuda, we have some of the best sand in the world because our sand is from some sources which when they eventually settle out it makes for a beautiful picture. So our sand actually comes from coral and it also comes from um, organisms which live in the ocean environment and die after a while. Now when these organisms die what is left is the actual skeleton and the skeleton for these organisms actually have a pink reddish color. So we find that the source for the pink sand on the windward side of the beaches is the coralline algae and on the, west, the leeward side where it's calmer is the bivalves. The actual shells become what we call the pink sand. Now the reason why the beach looks the way it does is that these shells actually have a lower density than the sediment which arises from broken up coral or limestone. So in the constant back and forth of the waves hitting against the shoreline, these will tend to settle out on top. And so at the end of the day, you get this wonderful picture of the white limestone-based sand with the sprinkling of these lighter shells, which you get this rainbow kind of pink um, effect. A beach has three main parts, the foreshore, the berm, and the backshore. The foreshore is the zone of most active change. It is the sloping portion which may vary from a few degrees to as much as 30 degrees. This slope is dependent on both grain size and wave energy, which are also interdependent. Strong wave action, such as found on exposed coasts, washes out the finer sand particles, leaving only coarse sand and a steep beach. Stones and boulders are often present on such beaches. However, on more sheltered coasts, finer sand is deposited, gently sloping beach results. The berm begins at the high water level and is the transitional area between the foreshore and the backshore. Except on very flat beaches, the berm has a well-defined crest at the seaward edge, formed by material deposited by storm waves or very high tides. The backshore, which is behind the berm, varies in width and character. The sands of the backshore are generally fine-grained and well-sorted compared to the foreshore. Here, dunes are formed when wind force distributes grains inland. While beaches tend to conjure up images of relaxation and fun, they also serve important ecological functions. They serve as a buffer zone between the land and the water and provide a habitat for a wide range of wildlife. Although the beach is a constantly changing environment, Animals occupying this environment have adapted to the constant motion of the sand, gravel or shell. In fact, some organisms are found only on beaches. I can't look at a beach now and not see it as a, 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 a bigger habitat for, for your plants and animals. You have bivalve shells, you have turtles that nest there, you have crabs, you have a variety of vines which are very important, mind you. They help to anchor the sand there. Many birds, reptiles and crustaceans, among other animals, nest and breed on the berm and the open beach. And sea turtles, including the magnificent leatherback turtles, 
use many beaches in the Caribbean to dig their nests and deposit their eggs. This turtle is using pure instinct to dig a hole here. And you'll see she has a very strong method of doing this. She digs on one side, brings it up, lays on the other side, and then flicks with the other foot. When she gets to her full depth, then she will make it into a round hole and lay the eggs inside of there. These are the leatherback hatchlings that have been born a couple days ago about arm's length under the sand and they've been digging out and what happens is they're all one on top of each other so as this guy moves sand the next one moves the sand down so they all come out in unison once they get out into the ocean they want to be now like this just after sunset when it's just dark predators are changing shift and so they can get out and dash to a whole new life and you know 20 30 years later come back and lay and set a whole new generation. As in most countries, beaches in the Caribbean have always been more than just recreational spots. They have been and remain today an integral part of the economic and social life of the region. The topography of most Caribbean islands is rugged and mountainous inland and flatter near the coast due to the island's volcanic origins. This restricts development and expansion in the interior. It is estimated that 40% of the population in the wider Caribbean resides within two kilometers of the coast. The sea provides livelihoods and is the basis of major economic sections in the region, such as tourism and trade. The sun, sea and sand image of idyllic vacations draw thousands of tourists to the Caribbean annually. This means that most of the tourism in the Caribbean is concentrated in coastal areas. The infrastructural development supporting that industry can contribute to the pollution of the coast through improper human sewerage and other waste disposal. The increased nutrient loading from sewerage stimulates algal growth and degrades coral reefs and seagrasses. Other detrimental effects are the destruction of the mangroves to build tourist facilities, which leads to siltation of coastal waters. Physical damage to reefs and seagrass meadows by divers, snorkelers and boat anchors all add to the destruction of coastal areas in the Caribbean. While the concentration of tourist activity in coastal areas is a key contributor to the pollution there, it is by no means the only pollution source. The coastal zone is the final depository of many pollutants that are transported to the coast through the waterways that flow into the ocean. These pollutants include solid and liquid waste, sewerage, runoff from industries and homes, sediment, fertilizers, pesticides and oil. Shipping is another source of pollution. There have been several oil spills within the wider Caribbean region within the last 40 years. Also, with increased shipping activity in the region, the dumping of garbage and washing of bilges at sea have become serious problems. Garbage dumped in international waters is driven by wind and currents to the shorelines of the Caribbean, causing more pollution that threatens the health of coastal communities and compromises the fishing industry. The fishing industry is heavily impacted by coastal pollution. 10% of Jamaica's protein intake comes from marine resources. And it's a significant loss if we were to lose that. So it is very important that we try to control the sources of pollution that are impacting the marine environment because not only will we lose the fish but the reefs themselves generate the white sand. This comes as a consequence of the breakdown of natural reef features and if you destroy that then basically what will happen is that your beaches will be threatened. If you threaten your beaches then the recreational value that you have will no longer be there. Another threat is the construction of harbors, groins and channels, which is usually accompanied by the removal of beach sand. This interferes with nature's processes of transporting coastal sediment and can lead to serious beach erosion. Another activity that contributes to dangerous beach erosion is sand mining, which is destructive and has widespread effects. Based on available data, the global sea level is thought to have risen by approximately 10 to 20 centimeters during the last 100 years. This may not seem like much, but sea level rise and other effects of climate change can have many detrimental effects. 
Some of these projected effects of particular significance for the Caribbean are more severe and frequent storms and flooding, inundation, erosion, and recession of barrier beaches and shorelines, destruction and drowning of coral reefs and atolls, disappearance or redistribution of wetlands and lowlands, increased salinity of rivers, bays and aquifers, reduction in biological diversity and possible wildlife extinctions. We need to ensure that we strike a proper balance. Facilitate development, but maintain the natural resources that will attract that very same investment in the country. The vulnerability of Caribbean beaches to these effects depends on their geological and surface features, their elevation, the level of human presence and value of resources likely to be impacted. Information is key to reducing the negative impacts of human activity on beaches. Coastal zone management programs must be created based on knowledge of individual coastal resources such as beaches or wetlands and their interrelation with one another. Each country should develop and maintain an inventory of its coastal environments and resources. This inventory will serve to provide a balance between addressing long-term environmental goals such as ecosystem preservation, more immediate socio-economic needs like tourism development. Any beach development should be planned so that land-sea interactions and the implications of the development to coastal and marine areas are properly taken into account. Environmental Impact Assessments, or EIAs, should be carried out for major developments to ensure minimal impact on the environment while allowing economic growth. A critical component of an EIA is pollution control. The amount and effect of pollutants on marine organisms and their ecosystems can be determined and controlled. Implementation of a plan to control pollution often requires a legislative component, especially when it involves restrictions to harmful activities such as beach sand mining. But legislation is only effective when there is adequate enforcement. Zoning is another strategy of a coastal zone management plan that promotes wise use of our beaches. For instance, the Buku Reef in Tobago has been designated a marine park and therefore enjoys some protection of its reef and the diverse ecosystem that it supports. Finally, public education and particularly getting the coastal communities engaged in education and conservation drives is another important element of coastal zone management. Education on the role of coastal resources such as the importance of beaches can be used on many levels from children to visitors. This community support and involvement in turn makes enforcement of legislation easier. Ultimately, an integrated coastal zone management plan is the way forward to maintain the balance between coastal economic development and the sustainable use of our beaches. But the best plans will not work unless every one of us does our part to conserve and protect the wonderful beaches of the Caribbean for the next generation to enjoy.